We are live now. Hey, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our Jack BD virtual meetup. Today, we have two special guests. One is Scott, who is a champion of, uh, I mean, captain of legacy codes, and another, Andres, who is a champion of de software design, I mean, web application design. Uh, so we have really an interesting talk today. Uh, how are you guys? Doing great. I'm great. <laughs> So uh, let me tell you one thing. Uh, here, here uh, Scott is from Texas, Houston, and Andres is from uh, Argentina. We have a huge uh, football fan here. <laughs> for, in fact, we have actually two group of people: uh, one for Argentina, one for uh, one group for Brazil. Uh, so, uh, can you tell us uh, about uh, something interesting in Argentina, Andres? Uh, yeah, so if you cheer for Brazil, you are completely wrong. You should definitely <laughs> change teams and cheer for Argentina because we are the best and really love soccer. Uh, <laughs> are, so, yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of Messi fan here. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, Being from Houston, you know, we don't talk about sports. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can you share interesting uh, something interesting about Houston, Texas? Well, um, it's not raining today, and we're very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting thing is, uh, in Dhaka, we love raining. I mean, we have a really uh, great monsoon here in Bangladesh. We love rainy season. Don't know why, but we love it. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, for for some um, uh, peculiar reason, we, we just love rainy, rainy season. Anyway, so let's start the topic. Uh, uh, Andres, do you want to share the screen now? So let me share my screen. Uh, can you guys see it? Yep. All right, so let's get started. But before I start, let me tell you two things. The first thing is that today is my birthday. So thank you for having me here, having us here. I am really, really happy to be spending part of my day with you guys. Hey, happy birthday. Yeah, the second thing is that, that this presentation, <laughs> thank you very much. And the second thing is that this same presentation, we're going to present it again next week at Java 1. So you guys are the first one to, to, get, to, know, to get to know it and actually doing a preview of it. So let's get started. And, and I guess this since it's a JAG group, you guys are mostly developers, right? But I'm, and I'm probably the only designer in the call. So yeah, let's call designers. And if there is anyone with the designer background here, uh, yeah, I'm glad you joined my team. So today, Scott and I are here to help you create great looking applications. And for my years working with Java developers, I've noticed that you guys have usually two problems that you have great ideas on your head, but then when you need to translate those, those ideas into reality, it never actually looks as it should, right? And the second one is that for the ones that actually work with designers, you have a hard time relating to them because, let's face it, this is how a designer works. The owners come up with some mockups or prototypes, then they walk to your desk and just throw this thing at you so <laughs> you guys can hook it up to your Java applications. Take my word for it. If you ask Bruno Sosa, he says that you guys always do ugly things. Always. And he's not alone. Baslur, who is here, like Gustavo, like many, many other Java developers, have problems either creating good-looking applications or relating to designers. But a great application and great experience is much more than just visuals. It's also making it low fast, making it work in every single device, independent of their size and capabilities, so anyone can see disregarding of their abilities. And a bad application usually has a huge impact, right? It, ha it creates unhappy users, poor sales, less engagement, and it's a huge impact in people's lives. Now, I'm not going to say that this is the worst thing that can happen in your life, mainly because I Googled that, and it seems that Justin Bieber has a lot to do with happening in your life. But for real, 
the bad UI experience is usually really painful. But if you actually get to create a great application, a great looking application, you still need to hook it up to your legacy Java node. And let's face it, Java 9 was released like two weeks ago, so technically you are all working on legacy Java applications, right? <laughs> so that's true. Today, yeah, so today Scott and I are going to teach you five practical secrets to create amazing applications based on Bootstrap. Much. It will not only give you a toolbox to apply it right away, but it will also give you an understanding of the essential design principles so you can relate to designers better. Then we will bring it all together in a production ready, responsive, and accessible dashboard build with Patternfly, an open source enterprise design system based on Bootstrap. And to close it up, Scott will show you how to integrate that Patternfly dashboard to your legacy Java applications. So, as we talked before, my name is Andres. I am uh, from Buenos Aires in Argentina, and that's why I have this sexy Argentinian accent. And I work at Red Hat. And I'm joined today by Scott, who is from Texas, as you know. And he's not, not only a Java, a great Java developer, but he also helps developers deal with legacy code. But since nobody really cares about us, let's get started with this adventure. You need to know to create amazing applications is to understand your user needs. Having empathy for your users is an essential part of design walking in our user shoes, right? But do you actually know what your user shoes look like? You probably all work in applications that have users. But let me ask you something. How many of you regularly spend time watching your users using your product? Probably few of you guys, right? And You'll be surprised that most developers I know have never ever spent even one second looking at users using their product. And they still make a lot of decisions based on assumptions. And assumptions can be really dangerous because if you assume, you will never be able to walk on their shoes. So never assume you know your users. I'm 100% sure that your needs are not the same as your user needs. And how do you actually know what your user needs are? Well, here's a secret to the most meaningful type of user research. And it's really, really easy to do. Have a user. And a user is a human being. It can be the guy sitting next to you, even your mother, your sister. It doesn't really matter, right? Just grab a human being. Then put them in front of your application and give them a task to do. And this task can be something super simple like login or create an account. Here comes the hardest part. Do nothing. Just sit down and observe. Don't ask questions. Don't guide them. Don't tell them what to do. Absolutely nothing. The task, either successfully or failing, you have a discussion. And this exercise is an eye-opening experience team. And I guarantee that it will completely change the way you think about your product. And it's extremely important to succeed because if you don't understand your users, nothing else matters. And my advice to you is to repeat it at least once a month. So take an hour on your calendar and repeat this exercise. How to discover what your user needs are. It's time to create content. And content like images, text, data, or the information that your users put in your application is the most, most important asset you own. And we take this content and we structure it with HTML, then we give it styles with CSS, and we create behaviors with JavaScript, what we call the front end stack. And if you don't know any of this, that's okay because Linus Trovals, the creator of Linux, once mentioned that he doesn't own a website because he doesn't know HTML. But the truth is that it doesn't really matter how beautiful your CSS or your HTML is. If your content stinks, your product will stink too. Now, you guys, as Java developers, you'll probably use a UI framework, right? 
And you have many, many options like material, bootstrap, foundations, stations, and Bulma. But since I'm a contributor to bootstrap, today we are going to talk about bootstrap. So I guess most of you know what bootstrap is, and some of you will know how it works. And according to bootstrap, it's the most popular front end uh, component library to build responsive mobile first projects on the web. And it will help you structure your content into semantic markup that is accessible, style it with responsive CSS, and then give it some behaviors with JavaScript. And let me show you how to set up a bootstrap component, or actually a bootstrap project. The easiest way probably to use bootstrap is with a CDN, right? A CDN uh, will get you right away to work on this, but uh, it's probably better to use it with NPM. So NPM is an old package manager, and to get bootstrap, you will type npm install bootstrap. In this case, I'm going to get the version 0 beta, which is the latest version of bootstrap. Now, if you're using bootstrap 3, I recommend you upgrade to bootstrap 4, which is much better. Now, since we are doing a live demo, I'm, of course, not going to do this uh, live because I'm, I am Argentinian, but I'm not crazy. So let's not do it. But I, I already done it before, and I have this installed here in my project. Now it's time for me to create an index.html file and open it on my code editor. So on the left, let me remove this. On the left, I have my code editor. In this case, it's Atom. Um, and on the right, I have a browser. And I have a Gulp file running, which, is, which has browser sync. So every time I change anything on my uh, HTML or on my CSS, I will see it on my browser. And if you, want, if you want to know how to do this, I'm more than willing to share it with you after, the, after this presentation. What I need to do now is to create a HTML structure. This structure will have a head, which is where I pass information to a browser. And we'll have a body, which is where I pass the information that I want the browser to render. So the first thing I need to do now is to create a link to the bootstrap CSS to grab all the styles. And then I'm going to load bootstrap JavaScript. In this case, I'm getting jQuery and Popper. This is for bootstrap. Now, this document is completely ready to use anything from bootstrap, actually anything out of the box. So if I, go, if I go to bootstrap documentation here, I can go to another components, under components. I can grab this snippet for the, for the components navigation bar. I have a navigation bar, right? And it's pretty easy to use components out of, out of the box from bootstrap. And bootstrap has a great collection of components to create all sorts of things from navigations to forms. But it also ships with a very powerful responsive grid system to deal with the layout insanity we have today. This is our reality now. And devices with different capabilities, different screen sizes, different browsers, and even the web is in places that have no screen at all, like cars or even refrigerators. We just don't know where our content will land. Will it be in a tiny device with a stylus, or will it be in a huge TV that has touch capabilities? We need to think about users. Humans, like devices, come in all sorts of sizes, shapes, and capabilities, too. And we need to take accessibility into consideration. And let me tell you a story. At the very top of this human tower is my second son, Federico. And he's one and a half year old now. We've been told that his hearing test gave a negative result, meaning that he might have hearing problems. And as I was sitting in the hospital with little baby Federico in my arms, I promised myself that I will do my absolute best to ensure that everything I produce is accessible. One year old, we test him again, and this time the results came positive. So thank God he's okay. But since then, everything I produce or my team produce 
have accessibility baked in. We spend lots of time thinking about Internet Explorer and how to render things correctly there. And Internet Explorer users are nothing compared to disabled people in the world. In fact, only color blindness uh, affects 9% of males in the world. So remember this. The web is accessible by default. If your website is not accessible, it's probably your fault and you need to fix something. And on top of that, we need to think about performance. You only have a few seconds of, people, of users' time. But according to the National Center of Biotechnology Information, the average attention span of a human being has dropped from 12 seconds in the year 2000 to 8 seconds in the, in the year 2015, which is one second less than the attention span of a goldfish. And that's right, a goldfish has an attention span of 9 seconds, second more than any of us. That's why you need to treat the web as it, as it was a liquid cat. It should be fast and fluid, responsive, accessible, and performant. And to cope with this reality and to support all of this, we structure our UI components into two types of structures, UI components and layouts. And these components are reusable things, right? And you probably know about them from Java classes, right? When you write object-oriented designs with Java, you create Java classes, and then those are reusable structures. And UI patterns are the same, are just reusable structures. So you should define components that stretch out to the size of its container, and then a layout or a grid system that will regulate the placement and sizes of each component. So never mix the layout and the components together in the same time. Always define first the grid and then put the components inside. And let me show you how the grid system works in Bootstrap. So let's go back to this example. So Bootstrap comes with a 12 column grid system by default and it's mobile first, meaning that they are first defined the styles for small devices, and then they are defined the styles for larger devices. So first, to create a grid system, you need to define a container. It will contain your grid. Then you will define a row for each row you want to create, and you will define a column for each column you want to display. In this case, I'm going to create three columns. Now, if I, if I say this, nothing will happen because, as I told you before, the grid is invisible, right? It doesn't render anything. So let me generate inside each one of these uh, columns a card. And this card is the same as the card you will get from the bootstrap docs. So I'm just basically copying and pasting the cards that you get out of the box from bootstrap. Now, you can create as many columns as, as you want. But, but as I mentioned before, Default with a two column grid system, meaning that you can, for example, say that the first column is six, the second one is three, and the third one is three. So, in total, I have 12 columns, and this was, works pretty well, right? But as you can see, my bottom here is overflowing my columns. That's why, we if you need more control, Bootstrap comes with five breakpoints for extra small, small, medium, large, and extra large uh, viewports. So for example, I can define that the first column will be six only on large screens and up. The second one will be, let's make it six, and then on large, let's make it three. And let's do the same with the last column. Responsive grid system, I will say things differently in different viewports. Let me change so you can see. So in this case, it's 12, 6, and 6. And if I go further down, I will see they stack together. So there are 6, uh, 12, 12, and 12, right? Let's talk a little bit about accessibility. I have really good news for you. If you stick to the snippets that Bootstrap has out of the box, 
because they, they have all the roles and every attacks you need to make an accessible website. So stick to that, and you should be OK. Now, this is pretty great, right? Creating things out of the box from Bootstrap, it's really easy. I just created something out of, the, out of nothing in a few seconds. But you will need to customize it for your brand needs. Or even creating new components, right? Structure your CSS is critical for a successful application. If you fail, you will end up with brittle structures that, will be, that it will be impossible to maintain in the future. And that's why whenever a Java developer writes CSS, they have this image in their minds, right? You end up putting important everywhere, and everything starts breaking down. And the truth is that your project will never get smaller, right? It will always grow, just falls apart, and the CSS just never gets smaller. My advice to you is to create a wisely architecture. So don't extend the components. And by extending components, I mean creating components, extending something. So if you have a list from Bootstrap, then you will create a component, which is a modification of that list. And then when Bootstrap changes, your modifications will just explode, right? They will have no support. Create Bootstrap on one side and your components on the other side, which are isolated, and then your application on top. And every component should be an island. Nothing should depend on each other. Let each thing be the thing. That way, when a new version of Bootstrap comes up, as we saw before, you can easily update without affecting your components. And the components you build today, they can live side by side with the components you build like five years from now. But this is probably a larger topic that I can't discuss it in full now. But if you're building an application, please reach out, reach out to me. I'm going to give you all my, my contact information. And I will be more than happy that, that take a look at your projects and help you out uh, to set them up for success. Now, coming back to Bootstrap, we are going to use SAS. And SAS is a CSS preprocessor that allows you to write CSS variables, mixings, placeholders, loops, and conditionals. And let's see how we can modify Bootstrap uh, using SAS. So going back to our project, let me first remove the CSS. So now I'm losing all the styles here, and I have like plain HTML. Now on my project, I don't know if you can see it, but I have this folder called CSS. And this folder called SAS. So this file here, which is mystyles.css. And mystyles.css, it's a compiled version of mystyles.scss. And empty. So now I can import Bootstrap. And then I'm going to regain all the styles I had before. It's just the exact same thing I had before. But the advantage is that now I can extend Bootstrap instead of overwriting it. So bootstrap variables here, and I can take a look at, at any variable. You can see here they have variables for absolutely every component. And I can, for example, look for a body background, which is a variable I know it exists. Let's find it. Changing from the default to something different like red. Looks fantastic. Um, now let's change, for example, the blue for the bottoms to be orange. And um, yeah, you can specify whatever thing on, on your variables, change it, and then you will have a new page. The thing about this is that when you create a new component, you can absolutely do something like reusing the body background here. This way, you can keep visual consistency. And this takes me to the last point to keep consistency. Now, nowadays, consistency is really trendy because we, are, we live in the era of the design systems. But Dick Nielsen once mentioned that consistency is the most powerful usability principle. Because when a user uh, have the same behaviors and the same components, he will know what to do without basing his, his responsive to uh, experiences he had before. 
Now, I know that visual consistency is just a tiny part of the overall consistency, but it is really important. So my advice to you is to create variables for at least spaces, to create margins and paddings, all typography treatment, those borders and animations. You define them once, and then you reuse them across your project. Meaning that if you need to change something, you just change them once, and you will still have consistency across all your components. And let me give you some design tips too. If you don't know a lot about typography, just stick to one font family. If you don't know a lot about color theory, stick to just one primary color and one accent color, and always follow the keys rule. So if you're doubting if you need to add more things or not to your web page, chances are that you don't need them. So today, we, we talk about all of these uh, five tricks, right? About understanding your user needs to create great content, about the importance of accessibility, responsive, and performant UIs, how to establish an architecture for succeeding in the future, consistency is so important. And we did all of that while taking a look at Bootstrap. And now it's time to put it all together in a production-ready, mobile-first, responsive, and accessible enterprise dashboard. We're going to use Patternfly. Now, Patternfly is an open source design system based on Bootstrap. And we use it at Red Hat to keep consistency across our UIs. And system as a set, of, a set of UI building blocks, like Lego blocks, right? Each one of these blocks goes through a process of design research, interaction design, visual design, and finally a crafted implementation. So when they are to our users' hands, they will have beautiful and tested components to build their UIs. And think about Patternfly as an extension of Bootstrap for enterprise use cases. So we changed the look and feel of all, all bootstrap components, and then we've added new components to accommodate for our user needs, like data tables, charts, vertical navigations, and much, much more. Let me, tell you, let me show you how to set up and build a complete dashboard using Patternfly. The best way to use Patternfly, just like we did with Bootstrap, is with NPM. So you will get NPM, install Patternfly, and then you will get Patternfly and all its dependencies. Now, of course, I'm not going to do this now. I don't really trust the internet while I'm doing the live coding. So let's remove this. But of course, I already done it. So here I have a Patternfly project. And like, like before, I have a header and a body. And then I'm loading Patternfly CSS and JavaScript. Now I'm going to create a grid. Remember, first create the grid and the layout, and then put the components inside. So like I did before, I have a container and rows and columns. Since Patternfly is based on Bootstrap, I can use the exact same grid system. Now this grid fluid is a grid that has 100% of the width instead of having breakpoints in the middle. Now I'm ready to create my dashboard with components. So first, I want to create a navigation bar. So I'm going to go to documentation here. I'm under navigation and horizontal navigation. And I'm going to find the snippet for a horizontal navigation. Then I'm going to paste it here. Now, as you can see, I already have these set up as snippets on my code editor. But all I'm doing here is just pasting, copying and pasting from the documentation. And I know it kind of looks like magic, but well, it just is, right? Using something, using Patternfly out of the box, it's like magic. Now, it's time to create some aggregated status cards. In this case, our users are DevOps, and they will need to see uh, their system at a glance. So I have cards here. Under cards, I can look at aggregated status cards. And these are those types of cards I want to use. So I have a snippet here. Um, but this is exactly the same as me going to the docs, copying that code, and then pasting it here. I'm not creating anything new. This is just Patternfly out of the box. Then I'm going to create 
utilization cards, and you can find them here, utilization bar card, and utilization trend card. So I can use my snippets. I have pre-built here uh, for a trend card and for a bar chart. And this is utilization card, perfect. So now I have this dashboard here, right? So I think I did something wrong, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, live coding. Let's see what I get. Yeah. So let me create this here. It's strange. All right. I will need to figure my, my snippets better. So this is a pretty nice dashboard, right? Like I could create it in a few seconds. And as I, do, as I did this, I have snippets to create things like, for example, this view here, or car view, or an empty state, or even logging out and having a login page. And I could create all of these with just out-of-the-box components from, as I mentioned before, pattern flying is based on bootstrap. So this is mobile first and responsive. So if I change the size of the screen, I can access in a device. Now, if you want to take a look at this, I uh, put together this link that you can go now with your mobile devices or with your computer, take a look at it, or I'm going to share the slides later and then you can take a look at how it looks in different device sizes. Shopify has an HTML and CSS version, which is the one I just showed you. Uh, but you also have implementations on Angular and React. All the details to use Patternfly and to contribute to a community if you want on Patternfly's website. Patternfly is completely open source, and you can use it for commercial use or for your users or for whatever you want, and you can absolutely contribute back to the community. Your phone's out. I invite you uh, to join this list here um, so I can, send it, I can send all the slides to you and I can send all kinds of advices. But you will also receive an email from me personally to have contact with me if you need any help. But uh, I'm going to repeat this later on, so I'm just going to throw it out here because part of my job is to help people uh, improve their applications. So, uh, if you want to follow this, uh, I'm going to be here. But now, since we have 10 more minutes, it's time for Scott to answer the question that you all have in your heads, which is, can I take what I just built and use it in your Java applications? So Scott, it's time for you to take it away. OK. Very good. Well, thanks, Andres. I'm, uh, I'm really impressed. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm impressed with how you make a beautiful web page like this. You always make it look easy. I end up with a page that looks boxy and bland and colors are baby poop green and squash bugs gray. I love what you built here, but one problem I have with presentations like this is I see all this amazing stuff, then I see the disaster I have to work with back home, and I realize I'll never be able to do that in my work. It's just too much of a mess to ever be able to make it look like that. I have to throw it all away and just start from scratch. Well, uh, Andres has an example of uh, some code that I uh, pulled off a public GitHub site. Looks just like code that I work with every day. Probably code that y'all work with every day. Doesn't this take your energy away just looking at it? The despair of knowing this is as good as it's ever going to get. It's just going to be patched forever and ever. Andres, what would you do if the developers gave you a page like this to work with? Oh, I would probably start crying first, and then I will, I will do the exact same thing the FedEx guy did, and then throw it back at you over the fence in a second. <laughs> right. Well, um, you can see this is a JSP file, and it's a header for other pages. So if you look at the top here, we have a number of variables being initialized for use later in the page. And then if you show the next page there, further down, we'll see uh, there. Depending on what page 
we're acting as a header for, we're going to render different information. Isn't that exciting? That makes it real easy for Andres to use, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. Okay, so we, you can see how it got this way though, right? Somebody needed to make some similar changes to two different pages, and rather than put some extra effort and thought into it, decide, well, I'm going to minimize code duplication. That's an important thing to do, right? And I'm going to save time. That's important too. But by doing it this way, now it's harder to read, it's harder to change, and it's harder to do it right the next time. And slowly, bit by bit, it got worse every time somebody touched it. So let's say that now you have to create a new page for the application. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to copy an existing page, make a few changes to it so that it does what you want. Then you're going to add a new variable at the top of this page, add another else statement and another set of code for this new page, right? Quick and dirty. And then you're going to go to the restroom and wash your hands because you know what you did is nasty and you can't even look in your, yourself in the mirror, right? So most developers I talk to, Tell me how much they hate working on legacy code. But you know what? That's what most of us do anyway. Think about it. Very few of us get to start from a clean slate and write beautiful, perfect code. 80% of any developer's work is maintenance. If you've worked on something for more than a week, you have something to maintain now. Now consider another thing. This old legacy code that's been around for so many years is still running for a reason. It does something important. Most of the time, it does it correctly. So it's still providing value to the company. Throwing it away and starting from scratch won't be permitted because it's just too much of a risk to the company. They depend on it. So are we doomed to work on this ugly disaster forever? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, I submit to you that by learning a few principles of good coding, and some handy techniques, you can go home at the end of the day holding your head high and knowing that you made the world a little bit better. Wouldn't that make your work more fun and rewarding? Of course it would. Now, we don't have time to go over everything we need to do to clean up this mess, but we can go over some principles we can use to improve things safely and effectively. The first principle you need to know is the Boy Scouts rule. Always leave the code better than you found it. Okay, they were talking about campgrounds, but the basic principle still applies. If you take this principle to heart and really live by it, everything else will just make sense. I remember back when JSPs were first introduced, we were told, don't mix the Java code with the HTML. But it was just so easy to do it wrong. So we knew the right thing to do, we just didn't do, didn't do it. And now there's a number of frameworks out there like Spring and Velocity and Spark, too many to mention that. They make it much easier to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing. So let's take a step back. Why do we need this separation in the first place? Andres can read HTML and CSS, but not Java. And that Java code in there is just clutter to him. So we keep it separate to improve readability. You know, we will read code at least 10 times for every time we write something. If it's hard to read, it'll slow people down. It'll make it easier for them to make mistakes. Rather than risk that, what do we do? We're going to copy and paste something. We'll fiddle with it a little bit until it does what we want. And that's, that's how we're going to move forward with it, right? It's embarrassing, but that's what we do. So OK, let's go back to adding that new page. Only this time, we want to use Andres' amazing styling and make the application better than we found it. So, we're going to build the page properly using one of these nice frameworks. I'm not going to get into the religious wars about which one to use. It all depends on what your current system would be. Rather than add another variable to this code and another case, we're going to take the header info that we need and we're going to put it in that page. That's called the single responsibility principle. One page, one purpose, one function. But this header.jsp is going to be called anyway, isn't it? Well, yes. Which leads me to my next principle. We want it to be better, not perfect, just a little bit better, right? We can take just a few minutes and we can make it just a little bit better. We don't have to go away for two weeks, re-architect the entire page header mechanism. Think of it like an old house. Your wife doesn't like the kitchen. You don't bulldoze the house to fix the kitchen. No, first you just paint the cabinets, and then you change out the countertops, and then you get a new stove, and then a new sink, one piece at a time. 
Same thing with old code. We fix one page, we check it in, we make it better. It's now better than we found it. <clears throat> How did we make it better? Well, first, we didn't add to the existing cruft, right? Next, we created something with some thought behind it. We did it the right way. We set the proper example for future code in this area. Why did people let this cruft grow in the original code? Well, that's the way it was done before. It's easier to follow an existing pattern. If you want to have fun code base to work in, you need to set the example of good coding. This makes it easier for the next developer who comes in to, that, to fix that code to follow the same pattern. And then the goodness starts to grow. This approach will work for JSP and struts and swing and AWT and DOS command line scripts. It works in everything. It just takes a little extra thought. Often it takes some extra time up front, but it saves so much time on the back end. And as you develop the discipline to make this a habit, it becomes quicker and easier to do this. Okay, that's great if you're creating a page from scratch. What if I have to fix an existing page? Now here's where it becomes magical. You act like it's a new page. You go and you rework the page according to the pattern that we set before. You remove the extra variables that are embedded in the code in this header page here, and you've gotten one step closer to a clean, maintainable system. Again, we didn't go away and re-architect things. It was just one small step in the right direction. In Uncle Bob's clean, clean code book, it starts out by saying small things matter. God is in the details. Small changes over time add up to big changes. Martin Fowler calls this particular technique of the small changes, he calls that the strangler method. You take a little bit of a big mess and you clean it up. And then take another little bit and until that original mess really has nothing left and you can throw it away. It's like how a boa constrictor will wrap itself around a victim, slowly strangle it to death. It can be very powerful. So there are just two fundamental principles. Attitude, it's a attitude way of thinking and approaching how to work with an existing code base. This is the attitude of a professional. It means you respect the next developer who's going to have to come in here and read through this to make some change. And the truth is that developer may be a future you. And you'll thank yourself rather than curse yourself for what you did in the past. <clears throat> so. I hope I've given you a little bit of food for thought, a little encouragement to look at an old problem in a new way, and some inspiration to really lead by example on your team, to take ownership in doing small things in the right way. If you have a specific question that you need addressed for how to apply these techniques, I'm happy to discuss it with you. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my information was up there before. Andres, is there anything else that you wanted to say? Yeah, I would like to say I'm probably talking from both of us to say that it will be a pleasure to help you I create, help you guys out create beautiful applications and deal with your legacy Java code. So we set up a mailing list. If you sign up there, uh, you will get a mail, a mail from us. So you have direct contact to us and, and we can absolutely discuss whatever your needs are. And we are going to share this presentation after Java One, so next week. So if you sign in, if you sign up there, uh, you're going to re receive on your email only an introduction from us, but also all these slides and code samples from this presentation. Very, very much for for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Scott and uh, Andres, for your beautiful presentation. The slides were awesome. I'm sure everyone likes it, and uh, our audience will be greatly benefited from your presentation, your, your content. Everything was just perfect. So uh, I'd like to get some questions. I mean, in fact, uh, let's see on the chat uh, people, what people have to say. OK, what I see, everyone is uh, saying happy birthday to Andres. Uh, for example, Jubar uh, Ahmed, Mamur Rashid, Rocky Bun Hassan. A lot of people, in fact, say happy birthday to Andres. So I would really uh, uh, appreciate your effort on your birthday to put, uh, give some time to us and share with uh, all these contents. And I would like to ask one question, which is uh, here, I, I think, uh, really important. That is, uh, what is your opinion uh, on material design patterns that uh, Google, I think, suggests? Uh, 
do you have any opinion on that? Uh, question. Ask the question. Uh, do you have any opinion on material design patterns? How do you feel about that? Measuring patterns? Material design patterns. Oh, material design patterns. They are really good. So material design is extremely good uh, library. I would absolutely recommend it more for, for something for an end user and not so much for an enterprise application because you know, on enterprise application, you, you really need to cram an information density on your screen. Uh, so you will need data tables and, and like very, very lots of information on your screen. This concept of very spacious things and cards and, and stuff. So if you're building an app for an end user and material design, it's an awesome choice. It has great documentation and great implementation. Uh, if you're building something more enterprisey, I would go with something like Butterfly, which is it was made for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so our audience will know that it's not really for enterprise, but it's, it can be good for end users applications. So Scott, I have yeah. one question for you. In fact, it's not a question. I would want to suggest you. You have mentioned a lot of patterns like clean code, voice code pattern. Do you wanna uh, do you wanna sh uh, recommend some books so that we, our audience can read? Well, uh, the, uh, the the Clean Code book by, uh, oh gosh, what's his last name? Uh, Bob. Um, uh, Uncle Martin. Bob Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Uncle Bob. Bob. Yeah, Robert Uncle C. Bob. Martin, I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's, uh, that's a really helpful book. Also, um, there's a book called Refactoring to Patterns. And I'm drawing a blank on his name too, but uh, both of those are really, really helpful. Of course, the the clean code is sort of the uh, the source book for doing things the right way, and then the refactoring the patterns is a, a great way to to take your your legacy code and and refactor things in the right way. So those are the the two top ones I I, I could think of. I'm sure it will it will send uh, more content through the emails uh, if you yeah, sign up. Sign up. Uh, and just, can you name the URL again so that uh, it's keep recorded? Uh, the yeah. the URL you show, showed earlier. Slides. Yeah. Wait. Let me get the slides here. It's at bitly. dot com. Okay. Slash amazing dash. So uh, I would recommend everyone uh, in, who are in here in uh, listening this uh, presentation, uh, please sign up to, to this uh, URL, and you will get great content from Andres and Scott as well. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for listening our presentation, and Scott and Andres for your time. You re we really appreciate. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, say again, happy birthday to Andres. <laughs> it's really, uh, <laughs> really amazing, and everyone. In fact, uh, I see a lot of chat uh, from the from the window here. Everyone actually, in fact, uh, <laughs> says happy birthday to Andres. <laughs> it's your lucky day, in fact. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm sure after uh, after uh, watching this presentation, everybody will uh, support Argentina, not Brazil. <laughs> yeah, you go Argentina. <laughs> uh, so definitely, you have uh, gained some uh, supporter. So thank you, everyone, Scott and Andres, for your wonderful presentation again. Uh, hopefully, we'll meet again future, uh, in future some days uh, with more content or more interesting topic. Until then, goodbye. Right, thank you. Bye bye. All right. Okay.